So the title of the talk is Scaling FVM with Multi-Threaded Execution. And actually, what does that mean? It's simple. That means parallel execution of smart contracts. So this is the, this is the goal, our main goal. And we're working together on that, uh, on that topic. And um, so more precisely, let's assume that you have a block that contains several transactions, two on this picture, and they access smart contracts. So you have TX1 and then TX2 on, on the block. The usual way for executing those transactions is to serialize them. So you have the miner that will execute first TX1 and then TX2, and that will be the same for all validators. And the reason is simple. This ensures that the state is consistent. This is what you see at the, the bottom of this uh, figure, where you see that x initially equals 0, and then uh, at the end of these two uh, transactions, x is equal to 20. And um, the idea uh, would be to execute those transactions in parallel, both at the miner and the validators, and uh, so leveraging multiple threads that are available on, on, on modern multicore machines. Uh, the problem that you observe on that, on that picture is that now X is no longer the same at the miner and at the one validator that is uh, uh, displayed on that, on, that, on that picture. So why would we need to do that? What's the expected benefit? Obviously, you can guess. I mean, it's to improve the blockchain throughput, maybe the latency, but that's not uh, that obvious. That's not sure that uh, this will be improved. Uh, by leveraging, as I said before, the, this multiple available uh, cores on miners and validators. And the challenge here, as you've seen on the previous slide, is to ensure the consistency of the blockchain despite this parallel execution. So we don't want to have this X that equals 3 on miners and 20, for instance, on, 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 on a validator. So how can we ensure that? A first simple idea would be to use static analysis to a priori detect the conflicts between uh, conflicting transactions, the conflict between transactions. Uh, so these static analysis uh, techniques could help build uh, an execution schedule, concurrent execution schedule, that would then be used by miners and validators to uh, execute transactions in parallel while uh, yielding the same results at all, uh, at all nodes. Uh, so that's what uh, we show here. So we have a bunch of transactions, five transactions, and they read and, and write two variables, x and, x and y. And uh, so observing the, 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 the sequence of read and writes, we can derive a graph uh, that will be used uh, to, to actually uh, uh, define conflicting transactions and make sure that when we execute them, we end up with a consistent results at all nodes. The problem is that uh, static analysis is not efficient with languages that are uh, quasi Turing complete and uh, that allow untyped references. So, for instance, that's the case displayed here where uh, transaction tree actually uses a function f to uh, access uh, using read and write. Uh, portions of the state, and so it's, it's very difficult to um, analyze that code and to know whether uh, transaction one, for instance, uh, is the cause of transaction uh, three or not. So the outcome is that uh, static analysis is not adequate for contracts written in languages such as Solidity. Just a side remark, you might know that some blockchains already, I mean, use that kind of, of, of techniques. For instance, that's the case of the of Solana, and actually, I mean, they, they are using a simpler form of, of, of static analysis. They are asking the developer of smart contracts to actually define, in, in Solana, for instance, the accounts that will be uh, touched, written and read by transactions, and uh, using these this, uh, declarations made by the, 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 the smart contract developer, they uh, can produce uh, non-conflicting non parallel executions. So the, the second solution, uh, if, if we don't want to use static analysis because we claim that it's not uh, possible to use that with languages such as Solidity, at least in an efficient and, 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 and broad uh, way, is to uh, detect conflicts at runtime using uh, runtime instrumentation. And this is actually what 
uh, Jan has been working on during his, his internship and what he will describe next. So the, the operating principle is the following one. We pre-execute to create a schedule that might be a fork join schedule or something that looks like that. I mean, the idea, again, is to have uh, a, a, a definition of conflicting transactions and, and a graph representing them, and then to speed up execution at nodes. And a, a block, note that a block later will be accepted if it comes with a valid uh, fork join schedule. A valid one is one that does not yield conflicts when uh, executing transactions. Plus, if the state that's uh, the final state that's been reached when the miner uh, produced the, 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 the block is the same that is observed by the various uh, validators. So I now let Jan describe what he did on the FVM to implement that solution and uh, the first results he got. Yes, uh, thank you, Vivian. Um, yeah, so first, before I tell you about my solution, I just want to quickly talk about the FVM architecture so that we have a common understanding of what we're talking about. So this is uh, the FVM picture um, that you might have seen already, but it's a bit uh, complicated, so I'll not spend too much time on it. You just can just note that there's a transaction that comes into a found coin node. The node itself uh, has access to the state store, to randomness and to cryptography functions. The uh, transaction is then entered into the FVM, um, where, uh, so this is the first boundary, and then there's a second boundary where an invocation container responds, and where the VASM code of the actor is then executed. And so uh, actors then have to cross all two boundaries again if they want to access the state. So for our purposes, I have here a simpler um, uh, description of what is needed for us to, uh, to understand uh, my uh, architecture, kind of. So again, we have transactions, a batch of transactions that we would, would like to execute faster. This is our goal here. Um, it's entered into a machine that has a call manager. Uh, the call manager uh, spawns a kernel and spawns an uh, invocation container for each transaction uh, or for each actor that is executed and passes it to the kernel. Uh, the actor uh, can perform, so it's, that's the advantage of having these uh, containers is that technically they're all local. They can access the outside world through the kernel and through system calls. So mostly, for example, they could access the state, they could access crypto functions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the container can also span, spawn new containers if uh, a send a call is uh, invoked and uh, the kernel would be passed along. Right, so how do we come in and how uh, do we add the parallel execution to that architecture? This is kind of what we looked at first. Uh, so as a reminder, Vivian told you this already, we have a batch of transactions. Uh, in the first phase, we want to realize what are the dependencies between them, and in this, that's, so that's what the miner does, and in the second phase, we want to execute them faster. So in this uh, quick example, we see that uh, transaction three depends on transaction one and transaction two. But transaction one and transaction two, they're independent and can be uh, run on two threads um, concurrently, whereas transaction three comes later. Right, so how we do this in code is that we start with transactions. Note that these, uh, it's a graph, but these are not the dependencies yet. These are just senders and receivers. Um, we take these transactions, we run them uh, through the normal pipeline, but we capture all the system calls, so all the, 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 the dependencies that they could have. Some system calls do not create dependencies, some do, um, and we need to be careful to capture the right ones. Um, and we use this uh, to create either a fork join schedule, which are the exact dependencies, or in our simplified case, we just create a set of the dependent transactions and the independent transactions. So this is the first phase uh, we, that we do with this uh, wrapped kernel. And we, once we're done at, uh, at the validator, uh, we, we don't just receive a batch of transactions, but we also receive this additional um, dependency graph uh, w inside the block. And what we can do now is that instead of having just one environment that executes transaction is to spawn many of them in different workers, and each worker will create, uh, will execute different chunks and we know that all the chunks will be independent and will not conflict. Uh, however, every uh, thread has only access to a local state and not the global state. So in a second step, we will have to merge 
So we, all, we don't write to disk yet, we just buffer all the, the writes, and in a second step, we then um, merge them into a global uh, state. We flush them into the global state. Right, so this is still a uh, work in progress. Nonetheless, um, we want to have a benchmarks as quickly as possible to kind of get an idea of what the performance gains could be. And for that, we need a realistic workload. And uh, to understand a bit what, what the workload could be in the future, uh, we can have a look at uh, current uh, EVM transactions. And this is uh, on the left, you see uh, an Ethereum block. Um, and every uh, vertex uh, is a, an account or a smart contract. And you see that there's quite a, a lot of dependencies um, between them. Um, you could think, oh, well, there's no uh, parallelization that can be done because it looks so, uh, like a big cluster. But actually, this is only on the account level. Since we use the FVM and we have the, the CIDs, it's very easy for us to capture fine-grained dependencies. Um, so even if two uh, transactions access the same uh, smart contracts, they might not uh, have interdependencies uh, between each other. So what we think we can obtain, uh, so for example, liquidity pools, et cetera, they might not even have create dependencies at all. And so we think we might be much closer to the picture on the right um, for the workload that we expect. And even this is without incentive incentives, right? So we might even uh, be much more parallel than that. All right, so this is one option that we to get a workload by replaying existing uh, transactions or ex existing blocks, which would, um, uh, would, would be nice, but also we don't know exactly how it's going to evolve. Um, and, it's, uh, and the other option is to have synthetic data, um, and to, which would allow us to parameterization and um, simulating potential past and future um, workloads. So we try to kind of have a mix, and I, I can just quickly explain our, uh, the workload we implemented for these quick benchmarks, pre preliminary benchmarks. So we have a bunch of accounts and uh, actors. The, the blue dot is an actor. The accounts all um, create a transaction, invoke the actor, um, and the actor simply hashes um, a, a certain value with the caller ID. Um, and for so, sp some reasons that I can quickly say, so we have, we can simulate crypt, uh, crypto system calls and read and write to uh, the, the block store. So this will allow us to easily verify correctness of our, of our implementation by verifying the, the x, the value of x at the end of the, the, the execution between a sequential and a concurrent execution, for example. Um, we invoke other actors, so we uh, test the send system calls, and we, we make sure that because these are um, all Rust actors, right, and the Rust compiler can optimize quite a lot, uh, we think we make sure that the workload cannot be optimized uh, by the compiler. Um, right, so before we change anything, we wanted to have some quick benchmarks. Um, and this is the first kind of benchmark that we get, where we see um, on the x-axis the, the batch the size that we get um, from 0 to 1,000 transactions in a batch. And we see on the y-axis the average time it takes to execute the batch. And we see a um, very modest improvement uh, for the concurrent solution. So we kind of went back to the drawing board and kind of looked at uh, what uh, takes time. And we see these uh, blue regions are, um, so on the left is the system calls that take up quite a bit of time, and the, the, the um, WASM code, the actor code itself. But a lot of, uh, we realized that there was a lot of overhead basically in our, in our code that we could remove. Um, and then this is the current uh, preliminary benchmarks. Um, where we, sh we see that there is some advantage of having multiple cores. Um, we, get, we see diminished returns, but with four workers, for example, and a thousand transaction, oh, and a thousand transaction, we get um, about two uh, x, a bit more than two uh, x improvements, and about ten ten thousand uh, transactions per second execution speed, this, with this arbitrary uh, workload. Yes, um, so in the future, what um, do we plan to do? So we want to complete this implementation with the merging of the state. We want to verify that indeed our execution is consistent and that we didn't make any errors. Uh, most importantly, we want to compare it with different two-phase protocols. So at every step of the way that I showed you, there's different ways of doing things. Um, and we're not sure that we 
I mean, it's pretty clear that there are uh, other options. Uh, and, and we can compare with one-phase protocols that optimistically uh, execute transactions. And in the end, the big goal is to choose the best fit for the FVM. That's, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. That's it from us. So how do you sort of uh, quantify the maximum available parallelism in these kinds of workloads? What are your thoughts on that? What are the natural bottlenecks around the points, things like that? Sorry, the, the bottlenecks in the, in the workload? Yeah, I mean, in what's what's common. I mean, I think if you you know if you base uh, your sort of observations on EVM workloads, I think it's well for now. It's probably the best we can find, right? In yeah. many ways. Right. Uh, yeah, I think so too. Uh, and in the EVM, so this is uh, some joint work from my PhD, uh, ongoing work. Um, but indeed, I think. Uh, or we think that mostly DeFi is what creates uh, an NFT's marketplaces. So for example, marketplaces are designed in a way that um, a lot of times the same uh, field are accessed. Um, and so this, this could be a bottleneck. But again, this is, so this is because this is brand new, there's like no incentives for programmers to care about these things. So it's unclear to me really what the bottleneck is going to be. At the, uh, yeah. For now, it seems like it's DeFi and F NFT for Ethereum. So one question, when you mention workers, what is the, so, so you first do a pre-execution to understand the dependencies? Yeah. And uh, how do you parallelize that? So I, I lost, I mean, I see that you have a different number of workers, but how's the, how does this match into the architecture or, or like this, the different stages? So the, the pre-execution is not parallelized at the moment. This is run sequentially. And then so the, the miners would uh, need to have just better... Um, but then the, the parallelization is in the execution? Yes. So, so you, you pre-execute, you, you understand the dependencies, and then all of these workers that you were plotting is the amount of, let's say, threats in the actual execution in the VM, right? Yes. So I take yeah. the block, I pre-execute, and then I can launch or spawn different threads that are number of workers within the execution. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. This yeah. is why we call it two phase, actually. One phase wouldn't, I mean, wouldn't work that way. It would be optimistically uh, you know, executed in a parallel way. Whereas mm -hmm. we, we use a pessimistic approach where basically we first create a graph and then we use that graph to parallelize. These are the kind of two approaches. This is why Jan said in the future work we might want to look at you know one phase protocols too. That's uh, something. By the way, these two phases might also be done you know with a parallel execution in the initial phase. You know, exactly. So the initial phase can yeah. also be ex uh, parallelized. We didn't choose to do that. I mean, for the so I, just I didn't know what part we were. Yeah. No. No. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, the design space is 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 fairly broad. <laughs> so you need to pick one point and. So I have a question regarding uh, this picture. So if I understood correctly on the left, it's per smart contract. So each circle is a smart contract. And we see a lot of seemingly dependent transactions. And on yep. the right, every circle is kind of an object? or It's the same, this, the same representation, except we remove some edges um, because we assume that, uh, for example, routers can be removed, ERC-20 contracts can be optimized. Uh, so, so you kind of uh, remove it based on the type of... Yes, and type of, we're thinking that some contracts cr currently create dependencies, but they don't need to create dependencies if we were, they were programmed correctly or yeah. programmed in, with concurrency in mind. Can we say yeah, artificial dependencies? how to detect those dependencies that we can safely remove. But I, 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 if I can say something, actually in the future the idea is not to remove those dependencies, it's more to think about how to uh, give incentives for smart contract developers to avoid creating ah. those artificial dependencies. You yeah. know, it's like, uh, yeah. you know. Yeah. So I'm wondering how this would work with content addressable data because if you modify something there, then you inevitably have a different route. And a different, uh, if I understand correctly, each actor in Filecoin, uh, its current state is represented as the root CID. And if you change anything there, you change the root. And then kind of you have a conflict, inevitably. If, if two, two transactions would touch 
the data of the same actor, then they both have a conflict, and you kind of you you, you mean just just the fact that they touch the same actor, they will conflict. Is what you mean? Even yeah, if yeah, they are not, they, they, even they if they are not touching the, the same part of the state, the that's your concern. Of the yes. Actor state would, would be different, and that uh, seems to be a challenging. Yes, 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 yes. Thing. I mean, you're right in the sense that the root CID will change, but actually that's something, I mean, that's, I mean, but still there is no conflict, so there is something you need to... Yeah, you, you yeah. can probably merge yeah. those two non-conflicting yes. changes, but... Uh, as Jan was saying, merging is still a, yeah. an ongoing work, and indeed, I mean, b because the transactions won't conflict, because they won't touch the same part, but they will yield different CIDs, so they might be seen as conflicting transactions. So this needs to be taken into account carefully, and uh, yes. We need yeah, to it seems to be yeah. a bit tricky. You're right. I agree. Thank you so much, Jan. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much, Jan. All right, thank you.